In the last video in this series, we talked about the basics of a call through the panel system. We covered the ideal call from a panel office to another panel office, and we talked about the sounds the switch made as the call was being connected. If you haven't watched that video, I suggest you do so before you watch this one, since we'll be expanding on topics introduced there. This video will be all about the successor to the panel switch, called the number one crossbar. Here, we'll discuss the basic layout of the number one, talk about how an individual crossbar switch works, and also listen to a basic intra-office call and discuss what each sound means. Then, in upcoming videos, we'll listen to other types of calls and discuss a few of the other cool things the switch can do. As always, the usual caveat applies. The number one crossbar is a massive and complex system. I don't want to completely overwhelm anyone with information, so I'll be omitting some details for the sake of simplicity. If questions come up that weren't answered in the video, we can always do another one where we go into more detail. The number one is capable of completing calls to many different types of offices, and the signaling systems and senders it used changed throughout its life. So in order to get a more complete picture of its operation, I think it would be a good idea to talk about a few different types of calls, instead of just one. Finally, as I write this video, it's becoming apparent that the sounds of the number one crossbar don't give you an indication of what the switch is doing as much as the sounds of the panel do. That is, I can't hang my entire narrative on the sounds alone. And if I did, you'd get an incomplete understanding of the nature of the switching system. So I think we'll start with a little bit about what the number one crossbar is and the important aspects of it that you really don't hear on the call. Then, when we go in and listen to some calls, we can tie it all together. At first glance, the number one looks very different from the panel, and in many ways it is. You won't see any rotating shafts, gears, or clutches here. By the time the first number one crossbar was introduced in 1938, the panel system was about 20 years old. And in that period, several technological advancements had taken place that enabled the designers to overcome some of the more undesirable aspects of the panel system. Most importantly, they completely eliminated sliding contacts and sequential hunting for terminals, opting instead for a switching network comprised of a grid of cross points. These cross points could be examined and marked for closure on demand, which not only greatly sped up network access times, but allowed for the central control to have a bird's eye view of the state of the switching network at any point in time. This was not possible in the earlier panel system, and it's this greater emphasis on centralized control and immediate access to the switching network that made the number one crossbar a giant step forward in the evolution of switching systems. Additionally, each action taken in the number one crossbar is checked at each stage of call completion. And if any irregularities are detected, the call is rerouted or other preventative action is taken to prevent the error from impacting future calls. For this video, I won't mention each and every single test as it's done, but it's safe to assume that everything we talk about is somehow checked for consistency before proceeding on. The switching fabric of the number one crossbar is composed of frames of crossbar switches. Confusingly, the switching element and the machine itself both share the name crossbar. That is a crossbar switch. That is a number one crossbar switching system. I'll do my best to make the distinction clear during the video. The names of the frames resemble those of the panel system, and in many ways, they're analogous. The line link frame is where subscriber lines are located, and it's similar to the line finder in the panel office. Unlike the panel system, however, calls both originate and complete at this frame. Next, after the line link, is the district juncture frame. This weirdly named frame consists of, somewhat unsurprisingly, a number of district juncter circuits. The district juncter's job is to act as a sort of home base for the originating side of the call. It's in charge of supervising us, operating our message registers for billing, and providing the quiet talk battery for the originating end of the call. The next two frames are the district link and office link. These frames are the main switching fabric for the originating side of the call, and they make up a two-stage link between the junctors and the actual trunk lines to the terminating side of the office. 
Both link frames consist of a number of crossbar switches, which, when arranged together, make up a giant web of possible connections. It might be a good idea now to talk a little bit about the actual crossbar switches, so we can get an idea of how they work before we move on to the rest of the machine. A basic crossbar switch consists of a grid of contacts and a set of horizontal and vertical bars. The verticals and horizontals can be used for inputs and outputs respectively, or the other way around. For this explanation, we'll just assume that the verticals are inputs and the horizontals are outputs. Any horizontal plus any vertical can be operated to connect an output to an input. In addition, any cross point can be examined at any time to determine its current state. A crossbar switch is not limited to one connection. Any number of cross points can be connected simultaneously without interfering with the other connections. The limit of connections is only based on how many inputs and outputs you choose to have and how the backside of the switch is wired up. Unlike panel selectors, crossbar switches on their own have no intelligence or memory, other than their intrinsic ability to be open or closed. Gone are the sequence switches with 18 possible state positions. Gone are the brushes, trip fingers, rods, and commutators. Now, all we need to deal with is a matrix of points, which can only be in one of two states, open or closed. Because we've now reduced our individual switching elements to the minimum required logical complexity, we need some way to control them, since they can't do much on their own. This is where markers come in. In a number one crossbar switching system, the markers, yes, there's more than one, query and control the switching fabric to set up the call in the most efficient manner possible, given the system status at the time of the call. This is important, so we'll come back to this and talk more about markers later. It's also pretty neat to see how the actual crossbar switches do the job of connecting horizontals to verticals. Here's a 10 by 10 crossbar switch. We can see that there's 10 vertical bars and five horizontal bars. Each horizontal can be used to handle two adjacent levels. So that bottom bar goes down for level zero and up for level one. The next bar, down for level two and up for three, and so on. Each horizontal bar has 10 fingers poking out of it, one for each intersecting vertical. These fingers move up and down with the horizontal. If we want a cross point to close, we must first choose the horizontal that handles the level we want, and then close a circuit to its magnet to drive it upwards or downwards. Let's go with this horizontal bar, and let's move it up to close a cross point at level 7. As the horizontal bar moves up, the fingers move up too. The fingers on this bar are now able to be wedged into this space between the vertical bar and the operate card. We now operate our desired vertical bar, which will close the bar onto the finger, jamming it into the operate card for those cross points. This will cause the cross points to close. Once we've closed the points, the system can release the horizontal bar to make it available to other verticals. Our cross points will stay closed as long as the vertical, or hold magnet, is engaged. For the other non-selected horizontal levels, their fingers didn't move, and when our vertical bar closed, their fingers just weren't in a position to be forced against the operate cards. For them, the vertical bar will have no effect at all. Now that was all slow motion, but in reality this happens very fast. The crossbar switching system uses this same action done over and over again to complete calls through its switching network. And that's the great benefit of the crossbar type switch. It's a simple yet versatile way to make connections between any two points on a grid with a comparatively small physical movement and rapid operate time. Okay, with that information safely stored away, let's get on with our first call. On this call, we'll be using the older style sender equipment and an older style signaling system that you're probably already a bit familiar with. This call will be intra-office from our number one right back to our number one.
That probably happened a bit too fast to catch everything that was going on. Don't worry, we'll slow it down and explain everything soon. Now let's listen to the same call, but with the switch room audio instead. Just like in the panel system, the time between picking up the phone and getting dial tone is about a half second. In that brief period after we pick up our phone, a whole bunch of things have happened in the switch that we don't hear. The L relay in the line link operates, which causes the frame to recognize a request for service. The line link circuit identifies our vertical and horizontal position on the frame and marks it for closure. It then calls in another frame called the sender link, which will assist it in locating an idle district juncture and an idle originating sender. Once these have been located and marked, all of the cross points are closed, which creates a connection from our line through the first portion of the switching system to the sender, which gives us dial tone. As the sender is connected, the sender link and the sender itself perform a series of tests to make sure that the cross points have closed successfully, that there are no false crosses or grounds, that any and all information regarding the call line has been successfully stored by the sender, and that the sender itself is in the correct state to begin registering digits. If any of these tests failed, this connection would be taken down and we'd get a different sender. As we start dialing, note that in this old style sender, the dial tone is coupled to our line through the A digit register steering relay. So we continue to hear dial tone while the A digit is being transmitted, just like we heard in the panel video. The sender is now counting the digits as they come in. And it stores them on a crossbar switch. In this case, we're using the crossbar switch as a sort of memory. The verticals represent each digit in the series, and the horizontal levels store the value of each digit. Just like in the panel switch, once we finish dialing the third digit, the machine must make its first decision about how to route this call. That decision is made by the originating marker. Let's take some time out now to talk about the marker, because even though it doesn't make much noise that the caller can hear, it's extremely important to how the number one crossbar works. The originating marker has two main jobs to do. First, it must accept the office code from the sender, decode it, and return a set of instructions to the sender that will inform it how to complete the call. These instructions consist of a compensating resistance value and a class of call indication. The compensating resistance value tells the sender how much padding it needs to add to the trunk in order to create ideal signaling characteristics. The class of call indication tells the sender what kind of terminating office it will be speaking to and how it should communicate with that office. The translation information is encoded in the marker in this cross-connect field. When the marker receives the office code from the sender, it grounds a punching in this field, which operates a corresponding route relay. This route relay is the one that we want to operate for the 833 code, and it happens to be route relay number 41. When the relay operates, its contacts close, and they ground corresponding punchings in each of these fields, 
one punching per contact. These punchings are in turn connected by jumper wires to these punchings here, which connect the route relay grounds to operate translation relays in the marker. It is these variable cross connections that actually store the information. If I wanted to change the translation for a specific code, I can merely remove the desired wire, then reconnect it somewhere else, and a different combination of translation relays will be operated in the marker. Having operated the translation relays, the marker then checks the translation to make sure it's error-free, and then transmits it to the sender. The sender receives this information from the marker over a set of leads, and stores it in its own corresponding set of relays. Now that the decoding stage is complete, the marker moves into the marking stage. It will now identify the location of the trunks to our called office on the office link frame. Once it has located the trunks, it inspects each of them and determines which ones are available to us. Then, it chooses one and marks that trunk for use. Now that we have the trunk that we want, we just need to establish a connection to it. In order to do that, the marker looks back at our district juncture and examines all possible paths between it and the trunk on the office frame that it chose just a moment ago. Once it finds the best path, it closes all of the cross points through the district frame and the office frame, establishing a path to our called office. From the time the sender requested a marker to the time the trunk was set up and ready for us to use took about a half a second. Like many things in this switch, all of the actions we described occurred nearly simultaneously, separated only by some milliseconds. You may recall that in the panel switch, the actual setup of the switching fabric was done by the sender, counting pulses as the selectors moved. In the number one crossbar, none of that's necessary. Instead, the switching elements themselves are directly and rapidly manipulated by the marker. This has some other neat advantages, as we'll see later. And if you want to see a little bit more about the originating marker, I did a video on it a while back. I'll link to it in the description below. Anyway, back to our call. Although the marker makes a big noise in the switch room, we barely hear it on the call. The sounds we do hear are primarily from the sender relays reacting to what the marker is telling it, not the actual marker itself. Hear that? Those metallic sounds? Those are the relays in the sender storing the data coming back from the marker and advancing the sender to its next stage. The metallic sounds are just microphonics from the relays vibrating each other and introducing some noise into the talkpath. So now that the sender has got an idea of how to complete this call, the marker has gone ahead and sent it a release signal, and we disconnect the sender from the marker. Now, let's keep dialing. I'll finish dialing the entire call here, and then we can go back and go over everything. Once we completed dialing the hundreds digit, the originating sender closed its circuit to the terminating half of the machine. As soon as the trunk circuit was closed, the incoming trunk at the far end recognized the circuit closure and called up its terminating sender link. The terminating sender link found us an idle terminating sender. As soon as the terminating sender connected to us, it started pulsing at us, just like the commutator of a panel selector would. And just like in a panel call, the originating sender is listening for these pulses. You may remember that in the panel switch, revertive pulsing happened as soon as the thousands digit was dialed. But on this crossbar call, we waited for the hundreds digit. Well, in the grand scheme of things, a crossbar terminating sender pulses more rapidly than a panel selector does.
So in the interest of keeping holding time as short as possible, we can just wait until the hundred digits dialed before we even try to grab that terminating sender. That way, we're not just holding a sender longer than necessary. And so, as soon as we finish dialing that hundred digit, we hear our pulses. These are generated by this relay oscillator circuit in the term sender, and they come in three short bursts. Incoming brush, incoming group, and final brush. Once the originating sender is satisfied with the number of pulses in each burst, it opens the circuit just like it does in the panel system. Each time the circuit is open, the term sender detects this and stores the number of pulses it sent on its crossbar switch memory. We don't hear this storing action, but it's definitely worth talking about. On this crossbar switch, each vertical bar is one of our selections. Incoming brush, incoming group, final brush, final tens, and final units. An additional vertical on the right stores the frame number of the incoming trunk that's handling this call. Each horizontal bar is the value of that selection. So for incoming brush, we send four pulses. When the originating sender has counted enough, it opens the trunk loop, and the terminating sender stores three in its IB register. Remember that when counting reverted pulses, we always start from zero. So four pulses is zero, one, two, three. Back to the originating sender, which closes the circuit again for incoming group. Here come the pulses from the terminating side. And when we've counted one, we open the loop, causing the terminating sender to store a zero in the IG register. We do the exact same thing for final tens. And when the loop is opened again, we store a one in our FB register. You're probably wondering what's going on with all those arrows and relays operating in the originating sender. When counting revertive pulses, the originating sender always starts from the number of pulses it wants to count, then decrements down to zero. For this video and the last one, I've said that we're counting up from zero, just to make it easier to understand the signaling system. But electrically, inside the sender, it counts down. Therefore, if it wants to count to three, the first relay that operates is the three relay, and the last that operates is zero. Also, there are two counting relays for each pulse, since the sender counts the rising edge and the falling edge of each pulse. The bottom one is operated on the rising edge, and the top is operated on the falling edge of the pulse. And lastly, the zero pulse actually operates three relays, one on the rising edge and two on the falling edge. There's a lot more fascinating stuff to talk about regarding the details of the signaling system, but that really should wait for its own video. At this point, we can't do anything else until more digits are dialed. So let's go ahead and dial that tens digit. As we do, the originating sender registers it, closes the trunk loop again, and tells the terminating sender to start pulsing. We count to two and open the loop. The terminating sender stores a two in its tens register. Finally, we dial that units digit. But before revertive pulsing starts, we hear this. That sound is a peculiarity of the way the originating sender works, and if I didn't spend weeks troubleshooting this exact thing, there's no way I would have guessed what makes it. This sound is made by the sender removing our tip and ring from the dialing circuit in order to verify the results of a party test that was made before we got dial tone. This is required for the sanctity of billing. If we're calling from a party line, where two different subscribers share the same physical loop from the central office, then the sender needs to know which subscriber has placed the call so it can bill them appropriately. Because billing the wrong person would be really inconvenient for us, the sender makes this test twice, once before dial tone, which we don't hear, and once right now, which is where these two clicks come from. And immediately after those loud clicks, 
we hear the RP for the units digit coming back from the term sender. Now if the initial party test and the second test produce different results, the sender will stick itself right where it is and not ever allow the units RP to come in from the terminating side. It'll stay like that and not release until someone comes over and manually releases it by pulling a relay down. It's designed this way because if that test were to fail, it means that we could be billing the wrong person a whole bunch of times until someone actually notices the problem. So we want to be extra sure that everything's okay before proceeding. On this call, everything's just fine, so we complete the final units just like we heard. Now that the terminating sender has made all of its selections, it sends an incoming advanced reversal back to the originating sender. This signal informs it to complete the calling party's connection through the trunk and disconnect itself. At this point in the call, the terminating side is entirely responsible for the remainder of completion, so the originating sender can drop off completely, leaving the subscriber hanging onto the trunk and waiting for that terminating end to finalize the connection. At the same time, the term sender is bidding for a terminating marker, and when it gets access to one, the sender transmits the four digits of the called subscriber's line number to it. Upon receiving this information, the terminating marker must now locate the called line and test it to determine whether or not it's busy on another call. Since there can be at least 10,000 lines in one office, it would be impractical to wire each and every one of them individually to all of the terminating markers in the office. So to access the called line, the marker enlists the help of some friends, called the number group connector and the block relay frame. Now the action of these frames can get rather complex, so let's just stick to the basics here. After calling in the block relay frame, the marker uses it to locate the called line and then tests it for busy. For this example, the called line is idle, so the marker will release the block relay frame and proceed to set up the connection from the incoming trunk through the incoming link to the called line. Once this connection has been established, the marker releases the sender and then releases itself. And now, we just need to ring the line. That's the job of the incoming trunk. There's a series of relays in the trunk circuit that will cut ringing through to the line, and all we need to do is operate the correct one. Hear how the quality of the sound changed when the RC relay operates? That's because at this point, we're connected to the tone plant that's producing the ring signal. And for whatever reason, the tone plant over here is kinda noisy. So while the line is being rung, we get all that hiss. It's no big deal though, because if you were on a phone surrounded by ambient noise, you'd have to strain to hear it anyway. Sounds quite noticeable now though, doesn't it? Now that we've connected this call, I think we should mention something about the crossbar brand of Revertive Pulse. What we're hearing here is a very early example of a protocol, where the method of communication is abstracted and really has nothing to do with the inherent limitations of the machine itself. You know, the whole point of Revertive Pulse, as used in the panel, is to tell the sender where the brush is as it hunts over the terminal bank. Well, here in the number one, there's no brushes, no rods, and no commutators to move up and down. So why do we go through all the trouble of revertive pulse for a machine that doesn't even technically need it? Well, it's for backwards compatibility. You see, the number one was installed right alongside existing panel switches, often even in the same building. So rather than design an entirely new signaling system and redesign and upgrade all the panel switches in the entire country at the cost of perhaps billions of dollars, the engineers at Bell Labs just said, hey, why don't we just make the number one speak the same language as the panel? And yeah, it worked fine. Now, the crossbar can complete calls to the panel, and the panel can complete calls to the crossbar, 
and everybody's happy. Okay, let's go through that one more time just as a quick review. As we take our phone off the hook, a bunch of things happen that we don't hear. The line link frame recognizes our location on the frame, and with the help of the sender link and district juncture, we connect to an idle originating sender, which gives us dial tone. As we begin to dial, we note that the dial tone continues through the A digit, which is a peculiarity of these old style crossbar and panel senders. After three digits are dialed, the sender bids for an originating marker, which decodes the office code 833 and returns information back to the sender regarding how to complete this call. The marker also looks at the office link frame and locates the trunks to our called office. It then observes the state of the district link and the office link and builds a connection from our district juncture through to the outgoing trunk. Once it's done this, the marker disconnects itself to be used on another call. Now, we're back to the sender. As we continue dialing, nothing much happens until we get to the hundreds digit. At that point, our sender closes the connection over the trunk to the terminating office. This wakes up the incoming trunk in the terminating end, and it immediately bids for access to a terminating sender. As soon as the terminating sender is connected to the line, it begins pulsing at us. Lucky for us, we were ready for it, and as soon as the pulses start to come in, our originating sender starts counting them. Here, the terminating sender is pretending to be a panel selector, and as it pulses, we're counting off incoming brush, incoming group, and final brush. Each time we're satisfied, our originating sender opens the trunk loop, which tells the terminating sender to go ahead and store the number of pulses that it sent us in its crossbar register. We dial our tens digit, it pulses again for final tens. We open the loop, it registers, and now it's time to dial that units digit. Immediately after dialing the units digit, our originating sender does something important. It needs to make one last check to make sure of what party we are, in case we're on party line service. Recall that it did this when we first started our call, but we just didn't hear it. It disconnects us from the dialing loop, does its test, and then reconnects us. As soon as it's satisfied, it closes the trunk again to the terminating sender, which has been waiting for us, so it can send its revertive pulses for the units digit. As soon as that's done, the terminating sender transmits a polarity reversal back to us, which we interpret as incoming advance. That instructs the originating sender to drop off a call and cut our district juncture through to the talking position. Now, we're hanging out on the trunk and waiting for the terminating end to complete its work, which is actually happening simultaneously with all of this. On the far end of the call, the terminating sender transmits the last four digits of the called number to the terminating marker. The marker then calls up its friends, the number group connector and block relay frame, and gains access to test the called line. Now, it tests that line for busy, and if it's available, the terminating marker proceeds to set up our connection from the incoming trunk, through the incoming link, and out to the line link where that called line is located. Once it's done that, the marker disconnects and makes itself available to serve another call. Now, our incoming trunk rings the called party, who will, one of these days, hopefully, get around to answering us. Well, that's it. That's your standard crossbar to crossbar call. But it's only the tip of the iceberg if we're talking about all the things the number one crossbar can do.
So in the next video, we'll talk about MF intra-office calls and alternate routing, which I think is just super cool. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please ask in the comments and I'll do my very best to answer. See you next time.